In Chapter 7, we begin to learn about inferential statistics, the branch of statistics where we draw conclusions about a population based upon a sample. We're looking at three types of inferential statistics. In Chapter 7 and Chapter 9, we'll be looking at estimating a population parameter using confidence intervals. Chapters 8, 9, and 11 will be testing a claim about something using data. And in chapter 10, we'll look at the correlational statistics, determining if there's a linear relationship between two sets of data. The idea behind inferential statistics is that trying to survey an entire population is extremely difficult, if not impossible. And so we can take a sample, and if it's a good sample, if it's if the sample has been collected using a probability sampling technique, like we studied back in chapter one, then we can use that sample to try to draw conclusions about that population. And we get statistics from our sample. Sample measures, or statistics, are used to estimate population measures, or parameters. That's the idea behind inferential statistics. A point estimate is a specific numerical value estimate of a parameter. One example, the best point estimate of the population mean mu is the sample mean x bar. It's the best estimate we have for the population mean. A little warm up. A study found the body temperatures of 106 healthy adults. The sample mean was 98.2 degrees and the sample standard deviation was 0.62 degrees. Find the point estimate of the population mean mu of all body temperatures. We just said above that a point estimate estimates the parameter. And we know that the sample mean estimates the population mean. The sample standard deviation can try to estimate the population standard deviation. The, popu um, the sample variance can try to estimate the population variance. A sample proportion can try to estimate a population proportion. The ones we're going to focus on for inferential, inferential statistics are the mean and the proportions. So here, if we're finding the point estimate of the population mean mu, mu is estimated by x bar, and we know that the sample mean, right here, was 98.2 degrees. So 98.2 degrees is our best estimate for the population mean. But a single value isn't quite enough. It's very restrictive to say, I think the population mean is this, because this is my sample mean. So instead of looking at one single value, we are going to create an interval around that sample mean. And that interval is called a confidence interval. But let's talk about properties of a good estimator. And by a good estimator, we're talking about statistics. What statistics would be good estimators for parameters? The estimator should be unbiased. The expected value or the average, the mean of the estimates obtained from samples of a given size is equal to the parameter being estimated. The idea here is we can use the central limit theorem take lots and lots of samples with replacement from our population. And if we take all the samples of some particular size, like 5 or 30, but if they're all the same size, and we find all of the, all of the means of those samples, the mean of the means will be equal to the population mean. This is why that central limit theorem is so important. It's the part of the foundations of our inferential statistics. When we're considering unbiased estimators, there are three dominant ones that we'll consider, and they are the mean, proportion, and variance. The estimator should be consistent, and what we mean by a consistent estimator 
if we take a larger sample and a larger sample and a larger sample, we start getting closer and closer to our true population parameter with those sample statistics. And the estimator should be a relatively efficient estimator. Of all the statistics that can be used to estimate a parameter, the relatively efficient estimator has the smallest variance. It's not terribly critical that, that you memorize these things. Just know that these are properties of a good estimator. And this is what we're looking for when we move into this inferential statistics realm. Using the central limit theorem, we see that the mean, the variance, and the proportion are unbiased estimators. We're going to focus our efforts, at least in chapters 7, 8, and 9, on proportions and means. We talked about a point estimate being the single value that best estimates our population parameter. An interval estimate of a parameter is an interval or range of values used to estimate the parameter. The interval estimate may or may not contain the true value of the parameter being estimated, ultimately meaning that we could create an interval where the actual population mean isn't in it. Just like our sample mean may not be equal to our population mean, and a lot of times really isn't equal to our population mean, even creating an interval around that sample mean, we still may not be able to truly estimate that population mean. We'll talk a little more about that too. A confidence interval is a specific interval estimate of a parameter. It's determined by using data and a specified confidence level of the estimate. What we mean by a confidence level is we're looking at the proportion of times that the confidence interval actually does contain the population parameter assuming that we repeat this process a lot of times. So we take a sample, find the mean, create a confidence interval around it. Take a sample, find the mean, create a confidence interval. Take a sample, find a mean, create the confidence interval. And we repeat this so many times, then the confidence level tells us the proportion of intervals that actually do contain the true population parameter. The population parameter is a fixed number for the population, whether it's the mean, the proportion, the variance. It's fixed. That population is fixed. But the sample mean, the sample proportion, the sample variance, they change based on our samples. So we have this notion of variability with intervals, with, with, our, with our statistics. The most common choices for confidence levels start at 90% and go up to 99%. Usually you'll see 90, 95, or 99%. And for each one of them, they have a corresponding alpha. So 90%'s corresponding alpha is 10%. 95's corresponding alpha is 5%. And 99%'s corresponding alpha is 1%. Notice that all three of them add up to one. The alpha refers to the total area in both tails of the normal distribution. So here we've taken some graphs, borrowed them from a textbook to illustrate the point. Here we see alpha's point 0.05. We have a 95% area in the middle. And over on the sides, here and here, that total area is 0 0.05. So that we split it in two and we get 0 0.025 in each. If we take a lot of different confidence intervals and we try to determine if wh whether they contain the mean, this is a really great picture from Alan Blumen's elementary statistics textbook where it shows we've got the population mean here in the middle and that population mean does not change. It is a fixed number. But 
are our sample means indicated by the red dots in the middles of these intervals. With each of these sample means, we can create a small interval around it. And that's the idea. We take a sample mean and we create a small interval. Notice with this illustration, when we repeat the process over and over and over again, we have a confidence interval that does not contain our actual population mean. If we had 100 of these such intervals and our confidence level was 90%, then approximately 90 of the intervals would not contain the population mean. If we had 100 intervals and the confidence level was 95%, approximately 5 of the intervals would not contain the population mean. Next up is the margin of error or the maximum error of the estimate, which could also be the error bound, as some books refer to. And the idea here is the margin of error is the maximum likely difference between the point estimate of the parameter and the actual value of the parameter. And the point estimates that we're going to be looking at are the mean and the proportion and comparing that to our population mean and population proportion, respectively. We create the confidence interval by first finding the sample statistic, calculating our margin of error, and then adding and subtracting that margin of error to that sample statistic to get a range of numbers. This is our interval. The margin of error formula is different for each statistic, and it's also different for, for what tests that we're doing. So it's a very specialized calculation. You'll see the formulas in the textbook and, and in my notes, but we won't be using that formula. We're going to use technology to calculate it for us. I want you to be able to interpret what that confidence interval means to be able to understand what it means. Confidence intervals for means, in order to calculate them, we're going to use our built-in Excel and Google functions. We'll be considering two different situations for population mean estimation. One where we know the population standard deviation and one where we don't. But the confidence interval for proportion, in order to calculate the margin of error for a population proportion, we have to either hand calculate it or use a template. And a template is just a structured file in either Excel or Google where the functions are already programmed for you so that you don't have to worry about typing in all of the calculations and possibly making a mistake. If we were using sophisticated statistical technology, we wouldn't have to build a template, but Excel and Google aren't really, aren't really sophisticated for statistical tests like what we're jumping into. So it makes for some different techniques for rounding rules. When you compute a confidence interval for a population parameter, for a proportion or a mean by using raw data. So you are given the data, you have to calculate the, the sample statistic and then find the confidence interval. You want to round off to one more decimal place than the decimal places in the original data. If you're computing a confidence interval for a parameter by using a sample statistic, little typo there, sample statistic, then you round off to the same number of decimal places as given for the sample statistic. If we take the same data and we create a 90% confidence interval, we'll get one range of data. But if we increase that confidence level to 95% or 99%, we're going to get a bigger interval. If we look at this picture for all the, with all of the confidence intervals, these may be set up for 90% confidence, and a 99% confidence 
would extend it even more so that, for example, this one down here that didn't contain the population mean in a 90% confidence interval may contain it in a 99% confidence interval. Our means are going to stay the same if we're taking the same samples and we're just changing the confidence level. That just means we're going to get a little bit wider with the interval. But back to our page, some examples of confidence intervals and how we could write them. As an inequality with the less than symbols and the population parameter in the middle. With a plus minus, 22.3 plus or minus 0.4 or with parentheses, 21.9 to 22.7 students. You may recognize the parentheses, this is called interval notation. If you are writing confidence intervals, please choose either the inequality or the parentheses to do them. Don't use plus minus. Go ahead and find the actual values that are lying at the ends of these intervals. I include it so that you know what it means and know that all three of these are mathematically equivalent. A lot of times when you're looking at polls for elections, for example, at the bottom you'll see a plus or minus 